Hello again and welcome back to Know Your Ship with me Chase. Today we'll look at the Italian Littorio class battleships. There were three vessels of the class, the Littorio which changed its name to Italia after Italy's capitulation, the Vittorio Veneto and the Roma. Being the most modern battleships of the Italian fleet at the outbreak of World War II, they were used extensively in the Mediterranean, although only with limited success. Anyways, sit back, relax and enjoy the story of the Littorio class battleships. In 1934, Italy further increased tensions by building three powerful battleships. Once completed, the Vittorio Veneto class ships would be capable of 30 knots and be heavily armed with nine 15-inch guns. But at over 41,000 tons, these massive battleships flew in the face of the Washington Treaty limit of 35,000 tons. A dangerous new arms race had begun. The naval powers decided that they would build these big expensive monsters because other people were building the big expensive monsters and the only thing you could be sure that really could kill the other person's big expensive monster was a big expensive monster of your own. At 8.35 p.m. on the 11th of November 1940, the first wave of 12 string bags, as the swordfish were known, were deployed from the deck of the Illustrious, led by Lieutenant Commander Kenneth Williamson of No. 815 Squadron Fleet Air Arm. An hour later, nine string bags of No. 819 Squadron, led by Lieutenant Commander J.W. Hale, followed them. Before dusk, Cunningham had signalled Illustrious as she sailed with her escorts to take up station for the raid 180 miles south of Taranto. It was on the shoulders of this small group of 42 naval airmen in their obsolete aircraft that the course of the war in the Mediterranean rested. The aircraft that droned into the night towards the Italian mainland carried a mix of torpedoes, while others carried flares and bombs. The bombs were to be used on the cruisers and destroyers, and so divert the attention of the Italian anti-aircraft defences, while the magnesium flares would illuminate the battleships for the torpedo attack. The Maryland reconnaissance aircraft from Malta had plotted the location of the barrage balloons protecting the harbour. However, the slow, lumbering swordfish would have to face the combined firepower of six battleships, nine cruisers, and a large number of destroyers, as well as some 21 batteries of heavy anti-aircraft guns and some 200 close-range automatic weapons guided on by harbour searchlights. The string bags flew into a storm of fire, but dipped and weaved their way towards the illuminated targets. Two were shot down, but as the last aircraft flew out of the barrage of anti-aircraft fire, three Italian battleships were leaking oil into the harbour. The new battleship Littoria had suffered three torpedo hits, and the Dulio had been hit once. They would be out of action for five to six months. The third battleship Cavour was beached and awash with water lapping round its forward turrets. It was never seaworthy again. At a stroke, the battleship strength of the Italian fleet had been halved. Lieutenant Commander Kenneth Williams, who led the first wave, was shot down and he and his observer were taken prisoner. A second swordfish was also destroyed and the crew of two killed. By 2.50 a.m. on the 12th of November 1940, all of the remaining aircraft, some riddled with shrapnel, had returned to the illustrious. For the loss of two British aircraft, the balance of naval power in the battle for the Mediterranean had been shifted in favour of the Royal Navy. The following day, every seaworthy Italian ship in the harbour left for safer berths on the Italian west coast, reducing the threat to British convoys. It was a daring and successful operation that proved to be a turning point in naval history. It was a grievous blow to Italian pride and morale, but while the battleship strength had been turned in favour of the Royal Navy, this was less significant than it seemed. What it signalled was the arrival of air power as the decisive element in maritime strategy. Cunningham's success at Taranto would be a strong influence on Japanese planning for their attack on Pearl Harbour. Together, Taranto and Pearl Harbour 
signaled a close to the era of battleship supremacy. From now on, navies could sail with impunity only if they controlled the skies above them. Britain had gone some way to neutralizing the Italian fleet, and Cunningham's fleet could operate at will in the central Mediterranean. Campioni made a half-hearted attempt to prevent convoys from reaching Malta from Alexandria and Gibraltar. But although the warships of each fleet came to within gun range again off Cape Spartivento, Campioni was not willing to risk Italy's two available seagoing battleships against the Mediterranean fleet and withdrew back to Naples. It was Campioni's swan song and a dissatisfied Mussolini replaced him as commander-in-chief with Admiral Iacchino, whose handling of the Italian cruiser squadron had given him a reputation for boldness. In late March 1941, ultra decryptions of Italian naval traffic told Cunningham about an attempt by the Italian fleet to intercept British convoys ferrying luster force to Greece. Cunningham diverted the threatened convoys and ordered a force of four cruisers and nine destroyers to lie in wait while he sailed from Alexandria with his battle squadron and the newly arrived carrier Formidable carrying 24 aircraft including 13 Fulmar fighters and four swordfish torpedo bombers. On the 27th of March, air reconnaissance indicated that the Italian Navy was at sea and heading towards Crete. Admiral Iacchino sailed with three battle groups one of which included the battleship Vittorio Veneto. His aim was to attack merchant shipping and convoys and, if the situation was entirely favourable, to engage British warships. Cunningham's cruisers made the first contact and came under fire from the Italian battleship's 15-inch guns. Cunningham engaged her with aircraft from the Formidable and harried her with his cruisers, causing the Vittorio Veneto to break contact. A second strike of three albacores and two swordfish of number 829 squadron hit the battleship and reduced its speed, killing Lieutenant Commander J. Dalyolstead. RAF bombers from Greece also launched a series of attacks against the Italian fleet without success. This was the first instance of cooperation between the RAF and the British Mediterranean fleet against an enemy fleet at sea. Cunningham ordered a third strike, but the eight aircraft were unable to hit the Vittorio Veneto, being put off by the combination of anti-aircraft fire, searchlight dazzle and smoke. But in the melee that followed, they torpedoed and disabled one of the escorting cruisers, the Pola. Cunningham believed the Vittorio Veneto to be damaged and was determined to accept the risk of a night action in bringing it to battle. At 9.11pm, radar on the Valiant picked up a vessel on its screen that was stationary in the water. The British battleships Warspite, Valiant and Barham closed with the unknown enemy, but instead intercepted two 8-inch gun cruisers, Zara and Fiume, which were coming to the Polar's aid. With the help of searchlights, all three battleships poured broadside after broadside into the surprised cruisers, who, with guns fore and aft, were totally unprepared for a night action. As turrets and other heavy debris whirled through the air and splashed into the sea, before long, the ships themselves were on fire from stem to stern. Both ships were sunk, and in searching for the elusive Vittorio Veneto, Cunningham's destroyers came across the disabled Polar, and after taking off her crew, sunk her with torpedoes. The loss of three fast, heavy cruisers, two destroyers, and 2,400 officers and men, in return for the British loss of one aircraft and its crew, was a further blow to Italian pride. Alle ore 14.41, dopo essere stato decifrato, il messaggio di Supermarina venne consegnato all'ammiraglio Bergamini. Gli ordini erano di invertire la rotta e dirigere per Bona. L'ammiraglio Bergamini ordinò immediatamente di accostare ad un tempo di 180 gradi a sinistra. Alle ore 14.46, la velocità venne ridotta a 18 nodi e venne assunta la rotta di 285 gradi, che era la rotta di sicurezza necessaria per uscire dal Golfo della Sinara, per poter poi accostare a sud verso Bona. E appena presa la rotta 285, che era quella necessaria per il Golfo, cioè il Golfo della Sinara e poi accostare a sinistra per andare a Bona, mandò un messaggio a Supermarina e per conoscenza alle settima, ottava e nona divisione navale dicendo 
che aveva invertito la rotta e che dirigeva su Bona. Alle ore 14.47 un ricognitore tedesco osservò la manovra e avvertì immediatamente il suo comando. I tedeschi diedero disposizioni alla seconda Luftwaffe di attaccare le forze navali da battaglia. Decollarono quindi dall'aeroporto di Istres, in tre ondate, 28 Dornier 217. Alle ore 15.15 venne avvistata la formazione aerea in avvicinamento, formata da 11 bombardieri. Dato il rilevante numero di velivoli, il comandante in capo alzò a riva il segnale P3, che significava posto di combattimento pronti ad aprire il fuoco. Alle ore 15.37, i primi cinque aerei tedeschi avevano superato il punto previsto per lo sgancio delle bombe e quindi dovevano considerarsi in allontanamento. Fino ad allora, infatti, il bombardamento avveniva da 3.000 metri di quota su un sito di 60 gradi. Questa volta, invece, i tedeschi utilizzarono una bomba radiocomandata di nuova concezione, che veniva lanciata da 6.000 metri su un sito di 80 gradi, quindi quasi sulla verticale del bersaglio. Gli ordini previsti in un terzo argomento amministriziale, che era il promemoria DIC relativo solo alla Marina, prevedevano che le armi delle navi dovevano essere per chiglia, quindi che non potevano sparare contro formazioni navali, potevano essere utilizzate solo contro formazioni aeree e solo al momento in cui l'attacco della formazione aerea sarebbe diventato eh, operativo, quindi che la, le, forze navi, le, le navi fossero sotto bombardamento da parte degli aerei tedeschi. Non appena mio padre vide un segnale numeroso che si staccò da uno degli aerei, dette ordine immediatamente di aprire il fuoco. Data l'elevata quota a cui volavano gli aerei tedeschi, i cannoni italiani dovettero sparare alla massima elevazione. Nonostante ciò, risultando difficile la precisione del tiro, si ottenne un efficace fuoco di sbarramento. Alle ore 15.42, un aereo tedesco raggiunse nave Roma di Poppa e sganciò. La bomba colpì la nave nella parte centrale sul lato destro, tra la torre numero 9 e la torre numero 11 delle batterie contraeree. La bomba attraversò tutto lo scafo e scoppiò in mare, provocando l'allagamento del locale caldaie e macchine di Poppa. I danni causati immobilizzarono le due motrici relative alle eliche della estrema Poppa, riducendo la velocità da 22 a 16 nodi. Alle ore 15.52 un altro aereo sganciò la sua bomba su nave Roma. La bomba si infilò tra il torrione corazzato e la torre numero 2 dei cannoni di grosso calibro. Penetrò attraverso i ponti e scoppiò nelle vicinanze della camera deposito delle cariche di lancio. Abbiamo rappresentato schematicamente quanto avvenne per evidenziare la drammaticità dell'evento si creò all'interno della nave una pressione tale da scaraventare al di fuori della sua sede tutta la torre numero 2, presumibilmente uccidendo all'istante i 40 uomini di servizio all'interno. La torre, dal peso di circa 1500 tonnellate, venne lanciata in aria e ricadde in mare. Anche le motrici di prora si bloccarono e la nave proseguì solo per abbrivio. Si alzò una densa colonna di fiamme e fumo che raggiunse gli 800 metri di altezza e che avvolse completamente il torrione corazzato. Tutto il personale destinato al torrione morì immediatamente. L'ammiraglio Biancheri, rendendosi conto della tragica situazione in cui si trovava la corazzata Roma, dette disposizione ai cacciatorpediniere della dodicesima squadriglia di dare soccorso al comando in capo delle forze navali da battaglia. Il comportamento del personale della corazzata Roma fu esemplare. Moltissimi furono gli episodi di abnegazione per salvare i compagni feriti, così come fu encomiabile l'opera degli ufficiali e dei sottufficiali, che riuscirono a mantenere la calma e l'ordine. 
Molti persero la vita pur di dare soccorso ai compagni rimasti intrappolati. La nave cominciò a bandare sulla destra e a un certo momento l'ufficiale di Stato Maggiore più anziano, che era il tenente di Guascello, incise la rocchetta, dette ordine di abbandonare la nave. Subito dopo la nave si spazzò in due e i due tronconi si inabissarono. L'ammiraglio Bianchieri, nel suo rapporto di navigazione, descrive questo momento in questa maniera. Vedo il personale del Roma che in maniera mh, tranquilla si sta dirigendo verso Poppa. Alle 16.11 la nave si inabissa. La nave Garibaldi e la nave Montopoccoli, che facevano parte della settima divisione navale, defilano rendendo gli onori alla nave Morelli. L'ammiraglio Oliva, a seguito della scomparsa dell'ammiraglio Bergamini, assunse il comando della flotta quale ammiraglio più anziano nel grado. La flotta proseguì, con rotta verso ovest, in attesa delle istruzioni da Supermarina. Fu sotto attacco dei bombardieri tedeschi fino alle ore 19.40, ma l'unica nave colpita risultò l'Italia, riportando danni non gravi, dato che, ad ogni attacco, le batterie contraeree aprirono il fuoco, contrastando efficacemente l'azione tedesca. Alle ore 21, le forze navali da battaglia accostarono a sud e il mattino dell'11 settembre giunsero a Malta. And that's all folks for this episode on the Littorio class battleships. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I kind of apologize for the Italian documentary. There wasn't really that much footage about this particular class of battleships. I tried my best and this is what I could find. Also, I didn't really speak Italian, so I couldn't fully voice over uh, the, uh, I guess, native speaking Italian person doing the narration. Couldn't do that and I apologize. I you know, did put subtitles on there for you. So, you know, hopefully it gives you the good idea in the final moments of the battleship Roma. Aside from that, uh, don't forget to like me on Facebook and subscribe to my channel as I will be uploading more episodes in the upcoming days and weeks. Aside from that, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. And uh, yeah, see you all on the high seas when the game comes out. Take care.